straight through to Simon Darren. Thank you. Uh, a little bit of a handbrake turn now. Um, I'm just to give you a quick perspective before I get going. I'm coming from the perspective that if you want an analytical system that's going to do something, so it's slightly more practically oriented. And I'm also a neuroscientist primarily, although I'm an ex physician as I describe myself these days. Um, so I'm coming very much from a perspective of basic science. So, like any good scientist, when I uh, I uh, heard about the talk and agreed to do the talk. I first of all went to Google and looked up electroacoustic music analysis <laughs> and came across the acoustic graph, uh, which I hadn't, I hadn't heard of before, I'm happy to say. But, um, so I'm just going to use this as a starting point, not because I think it actually represents the state of your art, but uh, because it makes a, a fun target. Um, obviously, it's popular. It's assisted rather than fully automatic, which again, I think is what you guys are actually after. Um, Essentially, it has background layers, I'm sure you've done no problem as I do, showing signal and spectral characteristics and the option of sort of user added foreground signals that we have here. Uh, this is from a piece by a called um, Edric Bollis um, Caramonte from the Peninsula Arts Festival in Plymouth. So, the first um, component they have in the Peninsula is waveforms. This is very popular, I see, in uh, analytical tools. I'm tempted to show this to someone and say, anybody fancy singing it on the basis of that? No? <laughs> Can you even tell what it sounds like on the basis of that? I would say not. Time amplitude graph, it does have a deterministic relationship to the objective sound. If you give this to a suitable digital analog converter, it will turn it into the right sound. But you can't tell what it sounds like. So as an analytical representation, I would argue it's a pretty poor thing to include. It's not really all that much use. Uh, if you want to know what it really sounds like, Like this. 
So this is a better descriptor of what's actually heard than this. So if you want to include a spectrogram in your analysis, analytical tools, probably include that one. Very quick whiz through the auditory system. I have tons of slides, and these are probably the, some of the less interesting ones. So I'm going to go through very quickly, but do stop me if I go too quickly or something doesn't make sense. There are basically four stages in auditory processing, which is the auditory periphery, which we define as anything up to the cochlea, essentially. Uh, the ascending auditory pathway up to the auditory cortex, which would form a third stage, and then higher cortical regions, which you don't need to see on here. Um, Eduardo Miranda, uh, I'm acting as his spokesman today, um, informed, can analysis be informed by neural activation at each stage? And he has this uh, interesting idea that if you look at the neural activation at each stage, in particularly in the ascending auditory pathway, uh, this can actually be useful for analysis. So it's worth looking at what the different stages actually do. Cochlear, as I'm sure many of you know, has tonotopic organization, organized on the basis of frequency, uh, along the basal membrane, and it turns its output, so it presents its output to the auditory nerve. So essentially the, fu the function of the cochlea is to turn sound pressure into neural activation or electrical stimulation in the brain, if you like. This can be implemented and has been implemented in a number of models, the most popular of which is the Lion Passive Ear model, is Malcolm Slane again. Uh, this is again the same excerpt. This is now a representation of firing rates of the auditory nerve, so post cochlea. So it goes through the cochlea and presents, uh, produces this kind of output. Uh, it, it works on essentially by uh, having a series of bandpass filters, which is actually what the cochlea essentially does. Uh, series of notch filters, halfway rectification, automatic gain control, these sort of things. Uh, some of these are purported to be cochlear functions, some of them aren't, but the output of this is pretty reliably what you will actually get as the output of the cochlea at the beginning of the auditory nerve. Uh, so again, if you want something in your analysis, it will be a great thing to include. There are other models available, faster than the LP filter bank, popular one. So <coughs> cochlear nuclei, this takes, this is the first sort of uh, stage, the first way place where you encounter neurons along the process, so it's the first grey matter as we call it. This is actually concerned mostly with horizontal and vertical positions, sound localization. Uh, it still maintains a tonotopic organization. There's not really any evidence that it does anything other than just pass the auditory signal up from a, an auditory perspective. So it's really about sound localization. So you could have a cochlear nucleogram for Eduardo, which would be conserved spatial, uh, which is horizontal and vertical location. Superior olivary complex, similarly, again, concerned with sound localization. In the acid only, however, so if you're looking left and right on there, it doesn't care about elevation at all. So you could have uh, an analysis which would do that. Obviously, in electroacoustic music, this is potentially actually relevant because I know spatial manipulation obviously can form a large part of the aesthetic experience. Uh, so this type of information could actually tell you what people are hearing in terms of spatial organization. Similarly for the inferior follicular graph, so the inferior follicular is the next stage up. This is somewhat concerned with spatial location, though not as much as the other areas. Uh, it also maintains the tonotopic mapping, and arguably it combines this information. So there's some evidence that the inferior follicular graph is the first place where you will put together the spectral characteristics of what you're hearing and the location of what you're hearing to say there's something that's going to eat me over there, I need to run out of the way. Uh, this is a bonus line. The superior clicklist is not really considered part of the ascending auditory pathway, but I've included it here because it's absolutely central to sound localization, and in particular audio visual sound localization. So it actually has a partly retinotopic organization and uh, partly a sound spatial map, if you like. Uh, so auditory and visual come together here, uh, and really this is, so if you can imagine you wanted to give an audio visual presentation of sound combining sound and images in different locations, and maybe you want to play on a mismatch of sounds and images, etc. Again, activation there is very relevant to The thalamus, so now in the medial genetics of nucleus, which is a particular area of the thalamus, uh, this is often referred to as the gateway to the cortex. So this is the last area before you enter the higher cortical region. <laughs> it's concerned with attentional control. Uh, what you want to focus on, what you don't want to focus on, how you can suppress attention, etc. 
so if you are interested in sound stadiums, what the people are attending to, what they're not attending to, then again, activation of the balance could be very interesting too. Finally, the primary auditory cortex, it's located just here, in something called Heschel's gyrus, also called the transverse temporal gyrus, bilaterally, so both hemispheres, see there, it's a little bit sticking up there and there. It's surrounded entirely by secondary auditory cortex, except where there's a little gap, which is called Sylvian fissure. There. So this is really the main cortical area for initial auditory processing. All auditory incoming connections terminate in the primary auditory cortex. What does it do? It has a generally tonotopic mapping, but this actually differs between the two hemispheres. The left hemisphere is geared towards processing things faster, but in a broader spectral frequency band. The right hemisphere is slower, but more focused on narrow frequency discrimination. Uh, in that sense, it's popularly, but not entirely accurately, said that the left hemisphere is really devoted to language processing, the right hemisphere to music processing. This is not strictly true. If you damage either hemisphere, you will damage the function of the other one, but it's partly true. You can see in the study from uh, Robert Satori that uh, in presented with temporal stimuli, the left is more involved than the right, but in presenting it with spectrally fine-tuned stimuli, the right is more involved than the left. Now, in addition to this, it's been proposed, and we're in the, the realm of uh, wild speculation now, uh, that there are two pathways, two higher cortical pathways coming out of the primary auditory cortex analogous to pathways which are known to be exist in visual processing. So there are a what pathway, which goes to the prefrontal cortex, and a where pathway to the posterior parietal cortex. So where something is located in space and what it is. This can already, as we've seen, be accomplished in the ascending auditory pathway, but here you get to benefit from a lot more semantic, high-level semantic knowledge. It's not just there's a threat over there or not, it's um, that there's something very specific. How a neural activation in these areas is much more dependent on other processes. So if you present the same stimulus, the same sound to people and measure their brain activity in these different areas multiple times, your chances are you're going to get a different response each time and you're not know, really going to know why. Very hard to get reliable results when you're in that sort of, at that sort of level. So that was uh, what everybody calls the neurotechnology approach, is that we could measure the, the activity or we can model the activity of these areas and use them to inform analysis. It's a nice idea. There are some potential problems. Um, unfortunately, the computational models stop at the top here at the moment. There are no good computational models uh, beyond the top here. It's not inconceivable that they could be produced, at least for the ascending auditory pathway, maybe as far as primary auditory cortex. There are attempts to model this thing, uh, but at the moment, the complexity of the situation is, is well beyond existing research. Partly because stimulus response is somewhat variable, which is obviously a problem with the model. Uh, functional fiber tracks not completely mapped, so there are new imaging techniques to map fiber tracks to say which regions actually connect functionally with which other regions, functionally and anatomically, I should say. Um, but these are not fully known yet. And top-down influences are difficult to incorporate. So, as I mentioned earlier, from the thalamus downwards, there's actually a descending auditory pathway as well as an ascending one. And you can choose, up to some extent, what to focus on. You can filter things out, filter things in, which give your attention to. And these things would need to be included in this model in order for the model to be useful. And that's a very difficult job. In addition, unfortunately, there are no easy means of measuring activation in these areas in humans. Uh, in humans, generally, you can't stick electrodes actually into their brain, unfortunately, in some cases. Um, too deep for EEG. So electroencephalogram, stick electrodes on the surface, measure and try and guess where the sources are. Uh, it doesn't really work for deep structures, unfortunately. Too small for fMRI, that's where you stick people into a uh, magnetic resonance imaging scan, um, measure what's going on. So these are relatively small regions, and the spatial resolution of fMRI, good as it is, is not that good. So again, it's rather hard to actually get at what's going on here. In addition, online monitoring of brain activation, in case we wanted to not model it, but actually monitor it as people are hearing a piece of music, is uh, highly impractical in general. It's expensive, FMRI is 500 quid an hour, so in context. Uh, it's time consuming, 
And it's very sensitive to movement. Both of them are very sensitive to movement. If you move, you completely corrupt signal, particularly in fMRI, which is an extended EEG as well. So we've used top two models. That's as far as we've got. Uh, hopefully we can move beyond that, but that's the state of the art as it is. Perception inspired auditory analysis. Now I know you guys don't want to go down the automatic transcription route from what I said. Uh, nevertheless, I'm going to play to the opposition for a moment and talk about the MIA toolbox, which some of you may or may not know. So this is uh, a toolbox for MATLAB full of a bunch of functions that take sound files and show you various interesting or not interesting features about them, such as similarity over time. This is based on spectral content, so they'll turn it into a spectrogram, compare spectrogram of one second, two seconds, etc., and give you some measure of how the piece varies over time. It's perceptually potentially relevant. Uh, similarly, spectral centroid gives you a, a mean weighted spectral content at each time point. So you can see generally it's going to be higher around here, it should sound higher. So these things are perceptually relevant. They could be used. I mean, there are a whole bunch of other things, just a couple of examples. Uh, they do have many optional parameters. So if you want to turn it into an assistive tool rather than saying something you just press go and it tells you what you're hearing, uh, it is possible to do. You can choose which tools to use. You can choose which parameters to give. You can choose how to focus them. Now, so far, we've treated music as sound. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, Low-level auditory analysis, it can tell so much, but what about other aspects of, uh, of music? Emotion, how does music move us? You've heard excellent talks already about that. And similarly, cognition, high-order, high-level cognitive processes, what would these take place? Well, uh, neuroscientists like me in our wonderfully prejudiced world uh, don't do research on electroacoustic music because it's too difficult. So we stick to a nice and easy tonal music where there are lots of rules and we know exactly what's going on and we measure those sort of things there. So this is pretty much a research-free zone as far as electroacoustic music is concerned, a situation which I do hope will change. Uh, so I will tell you briefly about emotion, and then I will, if you'll indulge me, go into one specific example from tonal music, and it is relevant, and I promise you I will show you why. Uh, so arousal in the limbic system in response to a stimulus. In emotion, you presented with a stimulus, you get arousal in the limbic system, in parallel, you have a feeling, a sense of feeling develops. I say in parallel, so the common sense view is that you see something, you appraise it, oh dear, that's terrible, I now feel bad. In fact, it doesn't work like that. I see something, I immediately react to it, and I simultaneously come up with a feeling as to why. And these two processes somewhat interact, but they do start independently. Arousal in the limbic system is particularly focused on this structure called the amygdala. So the amygdala is, in some sense, your center of emotional arousal. And it receives inputs from three different pathways, as far as auditory inputs are concerned. Uh, there is direct subcortical inputs, so from the inferior colliculus, remember that area before, where we have spatial information and we have frequency information, and these things can be potentially combined. They feed directly into the amygdala, which is why I suppose that that area is detecting or opportunities. Uh, we have indirect, the so-called indirect pathway. This is connections coming from the primary auditory cortex. But we also have a long pathway from this region right at the front. So this is a very high level cognitive region for medial prefrontal cortex, ventral medial prefrontal cortex. And this is actually involved in suppressing the amygdala. So if, uh, well, I, I, I do sleep research as well as, as music stuff. If you sleep deprived people, for a night, for example, and you notice they're pretty irritable the following day. It's not just because they're feeling tired, but actually there is a functional decrease in the suppression for the ventral medial prefrontal cortex for the amygdala. So the amygdala wants to switch on constantly, and you're constantly suppressing it during your conscious time. Um, during your dream periods in sleep, particularly vivid dreaming period, or REM sleep, uh, actually that connection is also severed, and you have much higher levels of amygdala arousal. Uh, than you do when you're awake, which is why sometimes people can experience feelings in dreams but, that they rarely encounter in, in conscious life. Um, so, we have those three areas. How does this relate to music? Uh, so this is Leonard Meyer, that Gary mentioned earlier. Uh, he's come up with a series of emotion in music. 
Two types of meanings, referential meanings. These refer to external objects. This reminds me of so and so. Uh, could be this reminds me of the time when we heard this tune called the Honey. I, they're playing our tune theory by a music psychologist. And uh, there are absolute meanings as well, which is in terms of structural relationships within the music. This motive is developed in this particular way, that kind of thing. Oops, sorry. And uh, different types of analysts as well. The formalist says structure gives rise to an intellectual response and I don't care about emotion. Fine. There are expressionists who say yes, but it also gives rise to an emotional response and I'm interested in how that works. And what I describe uh, as the cognitivist, which is that the perception and cognition of structure give rise to an emotional response. And this is an important distinction because not every bit of structure that you put in as a composer or that you can see as an analyst is available to your listener. In fact, most of it isn't. So from a cognitivist perspective, certain types of structure leads to expectations which leads to tension and resolution. We are, as I say, I apologize, uh, firmly in the domain of tonal music in respect to research in this area. I'll come on to how it's relevant in a moment. Uh, so this is David Huron's theory. Yeah. It's different here. Never mind. Uh, there is something here called tension as well. So imagination, tension. So you have an imagination scenario to start with. Uh, given a certain event that may trigger a schema, the schema is a sort of a mental structure that I'll come to describe in more detail in a moment, uh, it will could potentially trigger tension. What's going to happen next? When the event comes, you rapidly make a prediction. You, can, you also have a reaction, and then you appraise to see whether was my prediction correct, not correct. If it's not correct, I need to reevaluate this. And this process would involve an emotional response. So this is believed to be the reason that people have any sort of emotional response to tonal music. Wittgenstein pointed out, well, this is strange because we're talking about expectations and violations of expectations, but I've heard this piece a thousand times before. How can I possibly be surprised by anything anymore? And so psychologists answer that by saying there are two different types of expectations. There are veridical expectations. I know exactly what's going to happen because I've seen it before or I've got the score in front of me. And schematic expectations. My schema for tonal music says that the dominant chord should be followed by a tonic chord, and if it isn't, it's going to be violated. So schema theory. Schema is a mental structure. It's activated by situational context. In the case of tonal music, you just play a piece of music. Uh, chess is another one. Creates a set of expectations about what will happen in that situation. So that's very important. The schema is triggered, it brings with it other expectations based on experience, and you say, I think something is going to happen now. And this is what composers play with routinely. Schema conformant items are easier to process and remember. Okay. Um, so this has been evaluated. I, I won't go into the details here too much, but in uh, the concept of tonal music, people just play a key context and then say, how well does this tone fit? It's called the probe tone method. It has been validated and tested in other ways as well, since this method's coming from a bit of criticism. Um, the result is that you can get what's called a key profile, standardized key profile. This is very robust, it's very similar across musicians and non-musicians uh, within the culture, so enculturated. Um, and this is set, so this is for C major. In C major, well, C fits very well, G fits very well, and A sharp doesn't fit very well, and that kind of stuff, I think. Uh, interestingly, it also reflects the distribution of uh, tone distribution statistics in Western tonal music. So in C major, you do get more Cs than other tones, and then more Gs, etc. Uh, so it's a pretty good match. Uh, and it means that you can come up with algorithms that can predict the key of the piece of music, etc., etc. Um, Kara Kromhansel, who's done most of the research in this area, uh, most highly cited music psychologist around, in fact, uh, says these are mental structures. This schema really exists in your brain somewhere. It gets triggered, you apply it, and this is what leads inevitably in the end to your emotional response. I should stress, tonality is not the only type of musical schema. Um, Gary was talking earlier about some other types. Uh, there are also you know, uh, spatial locations, for example, spatial schematas are very obvious types, which I know he's also talked about in other words. Uh, so it can apply to electroacoustic music, but not limited to tonal music here. It just hasn't been studied. Um, 
Does it have a neural basis? Well, yes, it does. The Anatar in a rather controversial study said it exists in the medial pre ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Uh, we didn't believe it, so we did a slightly varied version of this study and added some stuff to it, and we also came out with the same results, so we do believe it now. Uh, but this is also the same area which is known to house other types of schemata, so it's a very plausible region. Uh, so we think that these mental processes really do exist, and they really do have a neural substrate. So one of the implications of total schemata in terms of analysis uh, are parallels with language. So if you violate a tonal schema, uh, you get a particular form of response in the brain activation. So ERP is just called event-related potential, which means you play somebody, in this case maybe a chord that either fits with the total context or doesn't fit with the total context, and you compare the response over many, many trials and many, many individuals for these two different situations. What happens? Well, you can measure the difference. Interestingly, the difference um, for chord violations in tonal music is essentially the same as the difference in syntax violations in language, except that the language one is left actualized and the music one is right actualized. But otherwise, the same region, the same timing, the same format of the ERP. Uh, so this is more evidence in some sense that music uh, uses syntactic networks. FMRI studies have similarly shown a strong overlap of music and language, spoken language, uh, networks. So it's believed that tonal music, at least, is syntactic. I mean, it's theorists will tell you it's syntactic in structure, but actually this must hear it as syntactic in structure. But it suggests, um, well, okay, so I should say, first of all, then theorists really do think it's syntactic in structure. James' theory of tonal music is one very popular theory, uh, Fred Lerner, who um, Michael was talking about earlier. Ray Jackendorf is actually a psycholinguist, and this was entirely using terminology taken from psycholinguistics to show you just how much it is. The implication realization models similarly, these are all essentially syntactic expectation type models. These presuppose, in my view, a linguistic form of listening. When people hear tonal music, they approach it as a language they listen to it as language. Uh, I had very interesting personal experience of this when I was in America, actually. I went to a concert of Penderecki conducting his own work uh, with a friend of mine who was very much into Penderecki's music. And I came out of it afterwards, and I said to him, well, this is, uh, it was very interesting, but it was like listening to somebody speak Mandarin, in the sense that the sounds are very interesting, and the fluctuations are very interesting, the timbre is very interesting, but I have no idea what it means. Whereas when I listen to Mozart, well, I sound it's actually not that interesting, but it makes perfect sense. And what, it, what he said to me was, yeah, same here, but that's what I like about it. So in my view, there are two different types of listening, maybe more than two, but at least two. So linguistic listening and what I'm going to call sonic listening. Uh, nobody's done research on the area, it's uh, slightly politically incorrect to do research in this area, which is one reason why. Um, but I think it would really benefit from it, and this may go some way towards explaining different ways that you can approach different types of pieces of music. So the question is, if obviously linguistic schema, schemata are not really going to be applicable if you're engaged in linguistic listening, are there schemata in the listener that are utilized in electroacoustic composition? Could these be marshaled in analysis? I mean, some candidates have been raised by Gary and uh, including spatial schemata. Uh, there could be many others, but these I've never been empirically tested, so I think that would be a very interesting potential set of studies to do. If it is sonic listening, well, perhaps we need to look for global perceptual principles that we can use, which govern sonic listening, rather than any form of syntactic analysis. So in terms of analytical tools, maybe we should drop the syntax and start looking at global perceptual principles, which I think actually is not electroacoustic analysis systems tend to do anyway, so pretty much on track of that. Um, just before I go on to global perceptual principles, Referential and sensory emotion. So if we're saying that absolute structural emotion, it may be available, it may not. The evidence isn't really there. Uh, it could come from other sources in addition to that, such as sensory consonants, dissonance, and uh, apparent motion and referential aspects. So there are a whole variety of sources of emotion in electroacoustic music beyond just schematic violations. And if the compositional aim is to exploit this, then an analysis would do well to point them out. 
Some emotion actually can be directly mapped onto the town source. So these guys did an interesting study uh, where they got people to rate lots of different pieces of music and then looked at their uh, relatively low level auditory features and uh, said, yes, we can predict what emotion people kind of experience from these features. Okay. Um, I think it will, in general, it would be necessary to include external referential relationships. Uh, and to give you one example, it's a piece from Berez. You can tell me what you make of it, but I sort of know what I make of it. <laughs>
Stephen Brown has looked at a lot of these. Uh, it will equals conserved universals of things that he believes exist in every culture, but these are essentially inviolable. Um, Octave equivalence, this is a low level perceptual feature. Again, you really struggle to not get something here in Octave equivalence. Um, transposability, this represents the fact that absolute pitch, although it can exist, generally doesn't in any cultural population as a, you know, a large group. Um, and emotional arousal factor, so variations in tempo, attitude, register. Um, and he also put uh, discrete, use of discrete pitches as a conserved universal. I thought that was a deference to you guys. I would shift it to a common patterns instead, since I think it's probably not true for every type of music. Um, so these are things that are common, but not universal, predominant patterns similarly. Uh, these are more common than these in some sense. Uh, precise isometric rhythms in music, division, organization, and duration or rhythmic structure, those sort of things. And then a, a few antonyms uh, or antonym pairs, which can be used to characterize music if you want, whether it's metric or non-metric, solo versus group. I don't know whether you would need to include those in analysis or not. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes if it's not obvious, it may be beneficial. So, they might reflect underlying perceptual or cognitive principles. Very famous article by George Miller, Magic Number 7 Plus or Minus 2, uh, established as a characteristic of perceptual systems. Really. Why would you really need perceptual and short term memory in combination, neither in isolation? Uh, so he gave people uh, a bunch of pitches, and this is relevant to so any composers in the room, uh, between 100 hertz and 8,000 hertz, and uh, logarithmically scaled, so sort of even division in terms of pitch. Uh, and if you give people more than seven different pitches and you just ask them to number them one to seven and you just keep playing them and ask them to number them, um, they can't do it. They actually get confused if you give them more than seven pitches. So if you're, for example, proposing to give somebody a tone row of 24 pitches and hoping that they're actually going to perceive it, well, good luck with that. An inherent preference for duple meters over triple. Uh, this is, oops, sorry. Uh, from a study in infants, actually, who were too young to have ever had any music theoretical schooling, but they, um, when presented with uh, relatively ambiguous stimuli, they preferred to give it a pupil structure rather than a pupil structure. That's considered, again, a relatively low level perceptual, universal perceptual constraint. Finally, the role of music analysis. So, what's it actually for? What do you want to do with music analysis? Uh, Nick Cook likes to write about this topic, and he raised in an article in 94 about two distinct possibilities. Uh, one is description showing how people already hear music. Um, his argument was that that isn't music analysis and that's not what it should be for. Um, and another one, which is description, is suggesting ways to hear music, uh, which allow listeners potentially to hear music in new ways. So this is a relatively pragmatic perspective. You give people an analysis and say, here you are, now listen to that piece again and see, if, see what you can hear. And hopefully their aesthetic appreciation will improve them, a positive listening experience, etc. So, a taking the prescriptive approach, what you include in a musical analysis obviously depends on your objective. What do you want people to hear? Do you want to draw attention to particular features or listen to particular reaction at a particular time? Uh, Schenkerian analysis, I used to do this in the band by the Court of Human Rights. Um, <laughs> It invites attention to the underlying lineage, the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 descent through every piece of tonal music, or sometimes a 3, 2, 1, so they're having an off day. Uh, creates a perception of long-term tension and heightened sense of resolution. Uh, it does work, actually, as a, uh, in terms of encouraging people to hear that, believe it or not, in some circumstances. It's pretty limited, but it, it can work. Um, the only thing I would say about musical analysis as a description is that it should be subject to psychological constraints and don't try to tell people to try and hear something in a way that they can't hear. So, take into account those conceptual limitations that we discussed. Some possibilities or specific suggestions. Well, maybe replace spectrograms and cocograms and ear models. Create and incorporate computational models from early auditory pathway. I think that's a job for me rather than for you, but uh, it could happen. The spectrotemporal and spatial processing consulting are both very relevant. Uh, characterize the type of listening and the listener involved, that's linguistic versus sonic and things along those lines, and the likely source of emotion. Uh, so for instance, in Perez's piece, I was 
busy fixated on a representational sort of promotion, a structural analysis would really help me in that context. Implement some tools based on Gestalt principles. So let's just take into account conceptual principles and the musical universals. Thanks for your auditory process. <laughs> Thank you very much, Simon.